and then uh, and then it also came up or was also mentioned as part of the I'm trying to remember if it was the, the women-led organizations consultation. I think it was the broader subsector strategy consultation uh, where it was mentioned by uh, by other other colleagues within the, the within that discussion as a, a source of, of information. So definitely came up and we also talked a little bit about uh, the challenges in you know doing more, uh, or another version of uh, an updated version of Voices from Sudan. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, that is, a, it's a different, it's a different context now uh, with the government than it was when the, the first uh, study was done. Um, so yeah, particularly challenging to, to do that in this context, but we did talk about what that would potentially look like and, and how that could uh, uh, how that could be useful, I suppose. So yes, definitely mentioned, and uh, I, I think indications that it's being used. Um, and then, uh, so on the on the results from the consultations, uh, yes, happy to share. And I'm just looking at your comment in the chat, Catherine, before I go on. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, definitely have uh, have been kept aware of, of that process for Sudan. So yeah, that is uh, a great a great connection, and um, the colleagues uh, Akiko and, and other colleagues from the GV uh, subsector there are definitely strongly involved. Um, on the findings, so I think a lot of it, uh, a lot of the findings would not be. Uh, surprising to you all uh, in terms of you know we looked across uh, challenges a bit of a SWOT analysis in general um, strengths and weaknesses opportunities threats um, looking at uh, women-led organizations particularly but also civil society organizations more generally in engaging in the different uh, processes in Sudan including uh, coordination at the GBB subsector level at state level at national level uh, as well as some of the funding mechanisms, the Sudan Humanitarian Fund, uh, and uh, other kind of access to information. And I think, again, none of it particularly surprising in terms of challenges, um, you know, not having enough information, not having information uh, in accessible ways and with timeframes that are possible then for organizations to respond to, and particularly in terms of the funding, um, the funding mechanisms. Uh, I think what it really, one, one really exciting thing for me on the, the specific part for GBV coordination was that there was a huge turnout for this consultation, um, for this discussion. So we had, I think somewhere over 90 organizations registered to attend. Uh, we didn't have space for everyone, unfortunately, because it was a small room and it was an in-person in meeting. Uh, so I think we had somewhere around 45, 40 to 45 uh, organizations attend, which was still great. Um, and I think really speaks to uh, the, the efforts that have been made, particularly in the last couple of years to increase that, to increase information being shared from the GBV subsector to other, uh, to local organizations and particularly women-led organizations. Uh, and really, uh, I think uh, working very closely with them to try and engage more in Sudan Humanitarian Fund and, and other things. Uh, so I think that was a great first step and it was you know clear that they are still facing many many challenges in engaging in the various systems coordination and otherwise uh, and that the response from um, the response from other parts of humanitarian coordination are not uh, not always in line with the you know the, with the real push towards localization uh, that we so it's something that from this meeting we then spent some time advocating with uh, OCHA and others around uh, the Sudan Humanitarian Fund, for example, and how the the opening windows for applying uh, when they fall over national holidays, for example, uh, was, you know particular examples that came out. Uh, how long the window is, when the information is provided, uh, how many organisations can access all of these different things. Uh, so there were some very clear advocacy priorities that came out, uh, and I think, uh, so we, we walked through a, a bit of a session on, um, not a long session, but as part of that consultation, we walked through a bit of the, the process of advocacy, developing priorities, looking at targets and messages, 
uh, which I think the uh, was, was very well appreciated by a lot of the organizations there. And then I think also the fact that that then fed into uh, the, the next day's discussions on the, the strategy as a whole uh, was also really, I think, uh, really appreciated. And we had a couple of donors attend the, the session on uh, the consultation with women-led organizations, uh, which, again, I think was a, uh, a nice platform or nice access uh, for many of the organizations to donors that they may not normally see. Um, and uh, I think was really, yeah, was, was also a great kind of piece of information sharing uh, in a way that doesn't, doesn't always happen or doesn't mm -hmm. often happen. So... And um, that was really nice to see. Uh, and then uh, on specific kind of strategies or recommendations coming out of that, um, some were broader in terms of priorities of the subsector and what it should look, like, look at over the next few years. So some advocacy priorities on uh, um, addressing legislation in Sudan, for example, uh, but also some more targeted structural pieces uh, like, like the funding access or, or sharing information. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, that's maybe the top line pieces. Uh, there, there's more details for sure that uh, we can share once we have all of the notes of the, the workshops and, and that will go into the, the report that's shared out. But uh, I think those are the, the top line pieces that come to mind. Thanks, Tema. So it, it sounds like a lot of the discussion with the women-led organization of the local actors was about process in the sense how they could engage, how that could be better. More uh, than, yeah. than them talking about specific needs that need to be addressed or, or prevention, right? So we did both. Um, or, or we, we had content come out on both. Uh, there was definitely a lot of the process piece. Um, and then we did have some of the, the bigger kind of priorities or uh, yeah, needs uh, areas to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the process pieces came out in terms of what the barriers are to interaction and, and what they need. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Catherine is asking if, if you had participants from all over or was, was it focused on one geographic area for Sudan? Yeah, so we mostly had participants from Khartoum in those sessions, uh, but we did, uh, well, so we had input through, um, or, no, let me separate, for the coordination training, they, these were coordinators from all, uh, all of the states that have AOR coordination systems. Uh, and then uh, for the consultations, there were a couple of participants from outside Khartoum um, who attended, but mostly it was organizations focused in Khartoum. So that was one of the recommendations that also came out that there need to be then more systems for bringing information, not more systems, but maybe a focused process on bringing information from state level to national level, uh, including through the state level coordination mechanisms, uh, as well as um, other, field exactly, yeah. um, and there's an NGO forum in Sudan, a, a relatively newly established forum, which uh, actually the, the subsector connected with to bring in organizations to the consultations. And we had a meeting with them later in the week to look at exactly that, like what are the organizations that, that might be smaller, only focused on one geographic area uh, that would not have had access to this process and, and how to get information mm -hmm. from them. So I think more to come. And then when the draft strategy is developed, that this is uh, that's based on this uh, this information, that looking at how to get the input from those different organizations into that. Thanks, Tema. I don't know if there are any other questions. I realized in the beginning, I, was, I said, uh, because Jennifer is in Somalia, that they had 10 sub-national levels, that's actually Sudan. Somalia is 16. In any case, it does it does speak to the need to, to have very good communications and linking mm -hmm. up to, to make it one structure, right? Yeah, absolutely. And particularly where it's grown technically, which I imagine uh, might also be the case for Somalia. Yeah. Great. Fulvia, I think that's an old hand, or is it a new one? You're very welcome to have a question if it's a new one. Sorry, old, old hand. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, 
I think with that, we move on to uh, Alina Pops, Elizabeth Hedge and Hope Harriet. They're going to uh, present on Empowered Aid. It's an online course to mitigate SCA, so sexual exploitation and abuse risks in aid distribution. And they're talking from, um, or at least Hope Harriet is from the Global Women's Institute. So I, I'm not sure, can I hand over to you, uh, Alina? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Thank you, Astrid. Um, Thank and you sorry, I'm just switching to phone because my internet's a little unstable. So I want to make sure if it no worries if it shuts off, you don't lose me. You see the Elizabeth screen well. Can everyone huh? see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, well, thanks everyone for your time and attention. Um, so we are joining you from the Global Women's Institute. Um, I'm in Washington, D.C., as is Liz, and Hope is in Yumbe uh, in northern Uganda. Um, and we can each, we'll take turns presenting, so we can each uh, introduce ourselves as we do that. Um, but we'll get started just by kind of really inviting you and, and sharing with you this resource um, that we've developed, which is um, connected to Empowered Aid. So the focus of Empowered Aid is on mitigating risk of sexual exploitation and abuse in aid distributions and doing that with um, those most affected. So really a focus on um, women and girls who are living as refugees. Um, the focus on refugees is because our funder um, is CPRM, but this, um, the methodology and the approach have actually been applied in a range of displacement settings, so in internal displacement settings as well. Um, and we found during the pandemic that some of our planned activities weren't able to <laughs> take place, um, which were really involved exchange and peer learning and um, sharing this approach with others in other countries. We've been focused on Lebanon, Uganda. We're now working in Bangladesh. And so what we wanted to do is create an online course that's free, that anyone can access, they can take at their own pace, that helps to share the methods and the approaches and the tools and helps um, different aid actors think through how they can make their programming safer based on what women and girls have said puts them at risk of SEA and what they've said needs to be done to make distribution safer. So that's kind of just an overview of the, the course and the project and, and the goal of the course. Um, but we'll take a deeper dive and we'll actually show you, we'll do a few demos during this presentation. Um, next slide. So quickly for those who aren't familiar um, with the Global Women's Institute, we are, um, as I said, we're in Washington, DC. We're based at the George Washington University and we specialize in research and action around violence against women and girls, women's empowerment and gender equality. And our aim is really to produce information um, for knowledge for action. So we want to inform programs and policies. And we do this um, really with a focus on participatory methods. My work um, is especially focused in humanitarian settings. We also work in development settings and in the US. Um, and we partner with a range of organizations, so women's rights organizations, NGOs, um, international actors and, you know, try to match our skills to their needs. So rather than us saying we think this is needed, we try to listen, understand what the needs are and see if we can support those. Uh, next slide. So as I said, the, the course that we're sharing today is part of a larger project that started out in the first two years as participatory action research. And the research question was what you see on the left. So how might the ways we deliver humanitarian aid increase risk of FDA with ineffective populations? Um, and this is because, you know, as we know, it's very difficult to gather quantitative data on the magnitude of FDA for a number of reasons, some of which involve, you know, the need to, to protect survivors and to do no harm but there doesn't mean that we can't produce rigorous evidence around what's happening, why and how it's happening and how to better prevent it. So the goal has been to do that, as I mentioned, through participatory action research with women and girls, which is looking at if we think of the underlying cause of this violence as an imbalance of power, how do we actually share power um, in the way that we try to address the issue? And maybe one of the reasons we keep having this issue is because we're not actually sharing power with them. 
So the, the goal is mitigating SDA risk through the creation or adaptation of aid delivery models that work to actively reduce power disparities and give women and girls a sustained voice in how aid is delivered. Next slide. Um, and so again, you know, taking proactive, proactive measures. So we talked about the research already. We talked about um, sharing power and we, you know, we reflect ourselves as we go on how we do this, how we fail to do this, how we can do it better. Um, but really trying to ensure that prevention of SDA is led by those most affected by it and also working with those involved in aid. So we work with local and international aid actors who are involved in food distribution and um, shelter and wash and a number of sectors to develop, um, document and disseminate tools and resources for safer aid distribution. Next slide. The first few years were around building the evidence. So this was the research. This was then taking the results of that and actually trying it out. So piloting the recommendations um, made by women and girls with local and international humanitarian partners. And we did this um, through six different distributions in Uganda and Lebanon to document how they work. Because often the, you know, what what I would hear in, in the past when implementing programs or what others may face is, you know, well. That would be nice to do, but it will cause us to um, have to spend more money for this distribution or the distribution. We have, you know, we have to get food to 10,000 people. We just don't have enough time. Um, and so we thought, okay, we'll, we'll test that. We'll see if having more women aid staff actually causes the distribution to be more costly or less effective in some way. And if it actually um, affects the perceived safety and risk of those receiving aid. Um, so that was the piloting phase. We also adapted during that phase distribution monitoring tools that agencies already use to make them more proactive in how they monitor for SDA. So based on the results of the research and the risks that came out, we added some questions to um, existing tools like household surveys that are used post-distribution, um, focus groups, safety audits, so that the staff were trained to really look for the situations or settings that pose a danger and trigger action when they see those situations are setting. So they're not waiting for a report to come forward, knowing that once that's happened, probably a lot of abuse has already taken place, but rather they're proactively looking for risky settings and situations, and then um, taking action or advocating for those necessary to take action to address that situation. Um, so the course, again, is meant to take all of this um, in a really interactive, format that's based on a lot of case studies, on a lot of examples, and that has the, the refugee women and girls involved as teachers in the course sharing their expertise with others so that they can learn about it in a digestible way, in a practical way, and think about how to apply it in their work. And next slide. Where we are now, just to say before we get into kind of a, a deeper dive on the course itself, is in our scaling up and scaling out phase. So we've been working to um, take the findings, take the approach and contextualize it in new context. One of the things we noticed in Lebanon, Uganda is that there were a number of recommendations that came out of that for safer aid that were, that were similar, that were pretty much the same, despite the vastly different context of rural Northern Uganda and peri-urban you know, Tripoli, the second largest city in Lebanon. Um, there were also recommendations, obviously, and risks that were very particular to those two contexts. We want to really distill, you know, what is um, coming out as um, applicable maybe in any setting and, and also making sure there's space to find out the particulars. So we're providing technical support, um, working with a number of local and international organizations in the existing countries. So in Lebanon, Uganda, expanding to new settings and new populations. Also, we've added Bangladesh, which is a different region, very different context, and then we'll be expanding within our existing regions um, this year to Jordan and to Kenya. Um, and again, incorporating participatory approaches and findings into standard distribution monitoring tools so that it increases accountability for the concerns of those most affected. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I think this is where I will hand over to Liz to just uh, talk in a little bit more depth about the course and give us some examples. Thanks, Selena. Um, yeah, so I will go a little bit more in depth into the course um, and really 
to, you know, to emphasize that this is a course that is meant to help um, aid workers and also research researchers, but the primary audience is aid workers, prevent SEA and aid distribution and listen to women and girls. Um, so the course will help you understand the findings and recommendations from how Empowered Aid um, you can learn about the participatory processes used um, so that you can apply them in your programming and research. Uh, the course is now available in four different languages. So that is English, Arabic, French, and Spanish. And there is a certificate available upon completion for, um, for, for each of those courses. So the course is um, completely self-paced and free, open access. You can enroll at the link at the bottom of the web, our website there. Um, and there's a, a button in the top right corner where it says enroll now, um, and you'll be taken to the Global Women in Institute uh, learning portal where you'll register and enroll as a user and then be able to enroll in the Empowered Aid courses. Um, like I mentioned, they are um, completely free and um, they're self-paced, so you can do them as you as you want to. In addition to the course itself, we also host live discussions with cohorts of learners who want to deepen their knowledge and discuss with their peers on how to apply empowered aid recommendations in their context. So we're working on organizing groups in each language, and this is really an opportunity for for you know other aid workers to talk to each other, you know to to share ideas with each other. It's led by one of the Empowered Aid team members. And in this, you know, really be able to kind of develop a work plan and understand how they can apply Empowered Aid to their context. Um, uh, so like I mentioned, there are five self-paced modules um, and they represent the three years of participatory action research conducted by the Empowered Aid team in Lebanon and Uganda. The course is very interactive, um, as you can see, you know, from a case study. This screenshot on the on the right is an example of um, a case study in the course, in the second module in particular, on on learning about risks, um, uh, SEA risks in Lebanon, Uganda. So learners will go through these simulate simulated exercises like this, based on the research where they answer questions about the risks they experience in this scenario. So we wanted to demonstrate some of this interactive content for you. As we mentioned, you know, we wanted to make this course as interactive as possible. So this diagram that you see here on the screen um, is from our fourth module on how to make distribution safer by applying empowered aid recommendations and then using those monitoring tools that Alina mentioned to monitor um, risks in aid distributions. So I'm going to, so in this example, you see there's uh, little numbers by each of the, the tools and they, the diagram shows at which point you should use the tools in your distribution. So, and, and then when you hover over, um, there's quotes that show from each of the Empowered Aid team members, um, you know, who use the tools and they're effective during distribution monitoring. So this is a little video you can see. Um, Yeah, when you hover over, a little box appears and it says safety audits are helpful for accountability and noting things that are wrong, even if there is no incident, but maybe someone contemplating when they know they're going to be observed from afar. It says from afar by a, uh, an anonymous source. They will withhold from doing it. And this is from an, a research team member of Empowered Aid who used the tool in Lebanon. So each of those tools has a quote shared from Empowered Aid team members or technical advisory group members. Um, as I mentioned before, we also have these evidence-based case studies. So these case studies are based on the qualitative data that women and girls shared with us. Uh, we created the case studies in which a learner goes through a scenario based on the data and answers questions to reinforce their knowledge built in the module. So in module one, the case study walks the learner through questions on the use of power in humanitarian contexts to emphasize the importance of power as the root cause of SEA. And I will, so I'll give you a little demo of this case study now. So it says, you are a South Sudanese refugee woman living in Bidi Bidi refugee settlement. You are at, a month, at the monthly food distribution, waiting in line to enter the food distribution point. 
An aid worker calls you over to talk with him. He says that he can take you to the front of the line and give you a larger ration of maize. Next, review the following scenarios carefully and select the best answer. We have been standing in line for almost two hours in this heat and the line has not moved. And the men in the line and others standing around waiting won't stop harassing us. I hope this line moves soon so we can get our food and go home. And then learners are asked the question, what are some safety issues that this woman faces while waiting in line at the food distribution? And you choose from the three options. And the first one was that there are some concerns. So, you know, nice try, but you're on the right track, but there's more. The, the other option is there are no safety concerns. And then the top one, the multitude of safety concerns. And this is correct. All of these contextual problems. Hello, the sun is hot and you seem tired waiting here for so long. I can take you to the front of the line if you would like. There may also be extra food, maybe more cooking oil I can give to you. Okay. And so then the scenario continues with more questions about what power the aid worker is using. So that's just one of the examples of the case studies that we have in the course. And then lastly, we have quite a few videos from, um, from members of the Empowered Aid team and the technical advisory groups sharing their knowledge on the project, collecting and analyzing the data, applying the recommendations and using participatory methods so that learners can hear directly from the team. And most importantly, we wanted to showcase the women and girls in our course. So the refugee co-researchers that we worked with, they, um, they, their voices are featured through videos like this one. They're featured um, you know, through their quotes and the other findings and research results. And we were actually able to share the course with the refugee advisory group since it was launched. And um, these are two quotes that they shared with us about the course and they're, they're being featured in it. So one, one refugee advisory member in Lebanon said she was happy to share our experience with the whole world and happy to see that we are making changes in others' lives. And a refugee advisory group member in Uganda said, I'm feeling very proud that the entire world was able to use my experience to learn and all the information I shared has gone out in the, to the entire world. I was afraid that other people would not know about this knowledge. Uh, for time, I, I will, I'll hold off on playing the video, but we can, if we have some more time at the end, I can um, certainly show it. Um, and then, so just a quick overview of the results of the course today. Um, so this is specifically for the English course. We launched the other courses in May, so we're still collecting data. But um, learners from over 1,200, um, you know, over 1,200 users have been enrolled with over 400 and um, 445 have completed the course. And so what is good is that we know that if, if the, a learner starts the first module, the, they're 97, they're 73% likely to go on to complete the course. And if they complete the first module, they're 97% likely to go on and complete the course. As I mentioned, it is self-paced, but on average users finish the course in about half to a full day, sitting down and doing it at once. It takes, you know, um, about an hour to, to complete each of the modules. Um, we have a lot of great, um, uptake from the countries that we're currently working in, and we hope to continue expanding. Um, and, you know, we've gotten some great free feedback from learners so far. They feel that it's very knowledge, you know, they feel very knowledgeable about the underlying, ca underlying causes of SEA and aid distribution. They feel very comfortable identifying factors that increase SEA, and they feel that the course is very useful for the humanitarian community. Um, great. And so I'll just go ahead and play some of this video for you all really quickly, because I know it's really great to hear the voices of women and girls. Uh, 
راحت البال ونعطتون الأوى إنه كيف هن يكونوا أوايا بس يروحوا مشوار إنه أنتوا عم تعملوا توعي للنساء هذا كثير كثير حلو وحبيته كثير هذا المشروع آه لا تجربتي معكم كانت أكيد حلوة كثير آه وحسينا كثير براحة لما نحن شاركنا هو المواضيع معكم ولما نحن وصلنا صوت لما نحن قدرنا إنه نحن نوصل صوت الناس اللي ما قدروا إنه يوصلوا صوتهم ولما نحن قدرنا إنه نحكي قصص الناس اللي ما كانوا قادرين إنه يحكوا قصصهم فهذا الشيء كان طابع منيح لنا وكان عم يعطينا خبره لقدام بحياتنا. يا دل في جاني كان ميتو جلنا ناكو دنا كان دي كاواتا يكونوا كولورو ايجونا دو كوكيو هي كوميونيتي. ورا يا كو دنا كا كويا كان كا كوندا بري دي كوميونيتي يو ايجونا رادا. لكن اكو دنا كا دي ايجونا بي هومان سنتر اي اس ار سي اي كادينا ويني اي بوليسي اكو دنا. كم سالان يا جويني Naku dana gadi, na wara beniro pegi. Iti ki biresi, iti ki soso urjo, iti ki mojo re ai kora ni kora itu pesi iman. Ah, kaju berana nak buku yuku e china de yuku e bay na liraki. I komen tiu i tu tunggu nak kuya sana gakata. Ridia sana ponda i wate ku i kediti i salo uju, wala i konesi naga kata kene le. So I'll pause there um, just to give you all a little taste of that. Um, so that was a deep dive into the course and now I'll hand it over to my colleague Hope in Uganda who will share a little bit more about the launch of the multi-language course and, um, and other resources that the Empowered Aid course have. Thanks, Liz. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hope Harriet, and I'm a research consultant with the Empowered Aid um, uh, in Uganda. Uh, I hope it's okay that I switch off my video because of the network connection where I am. Um, so at the end of May this year, we launched the course in uh, three additional languages, like Liz mentioned. We launched Arabic, French, and Spanish. And we share this through various social media platforms, uh, networks, but also we're keen to target the, the, the PCR coordination groups and the various networks, you know, in order to be able to reach those uh, native French and Arabic Spanish speakers as well. So based on this launch as well, we drove learners to the English course that had already launched uh, last year in October and uh, con uh, Conduct, conducting on the English course at the same time. So we had an increase of uh, about 30% new learners during the period when we launched the, the different language as well. This was an increase uh, from the 18% that we initially had. Uh, we used various media platforms, like I did mention, um, reached out to different partners. And these are some of the uh, enrollments uh, during the time we launched at the beginning so far. Uh, next, next slide, please, please. Yeah, we also had the targeted outreach to Latin America and Western Central Africa with the launch of the course. We presented this in the PCR network and working groups as well. Had uh, the open discussions around how we can collaborate because we are cognizant of the fact that there is already work going on. So trying to identify areas and opportunities of collaboration. Some of the potential areas include for the online course and the contextualization a piece of work that we are currently working on to see how organizations can um, take on the work of Empowered Aid, the research that we've done, and be able to contextualize it to fit within the context where they are working. Um, Liz, you can slide onto that, go into the next slide, it's okay. Uh, yeah, so we have a couple of resources uh, based on the experience that we have developed and the work that we've done over the years. So we have a resource page, a resource guide for an organization that would like to have all the resources that we have done in one place. So some of the things that are in this particular uh, guide, for example, we have the findings, we have briefs, we have sector specific tip sheets, we have the training manuals and the different trainings. So it's like a one stop center that we can easily distribute around for organizations that want to know all the work that we are doing on empowered aid and the different, you know, webinars that we've conducted, everything is within this two pager so that it's easier to access our materials. 
Um, next page, please. Also, one of the biggest questions that we do encounter is organizations that are interested and in talking uh, and learning about our work and interested about uh, with the uptake of our work and they ask us, so how do I integrate, you know, uh, important aid work into my own programming. So we've developed a roadmap for organizations like that or partners that are keen in taking up the work. It's a five step a uh, roadmap where partners, you know, take it step by step, like a step one, they will have to first understand the, um, the risks by reading through the findings that we already have. So it's a step by step guidance around, okay, step one, this is what you can do and see what you do, then this is the next step. So we hope that with this roadmap, it's much easier <coughs> for organizations, even if we're not physically there, we're able to provide them with that support. They're able to pick it and run with it based on the roadmap, as well as the resources that we already have on our website as well. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, we have a website that we've launched where all the resources that we've been talking about, the, the briefs, the guides, the training manuals, everything that we've been talking about is now on this website. So we recently launched it and we hope that it can it's accessible enough for organizations to be able to, to find what they need. Maybe Liz can click on the on the on the link and show you how it's looking like. Just a quick, yeah. Okay, so maybe as Liz is doing that, um, yeah, so we welcome any questions. Otherwise, thank you so much. Uh, this is us and we hope that partners can really share the, the online course with organizations where they're working with, but also further spread it within their networks so that we can have the opportunity to learn more as we go along, but also to make access, you know, access aid to aid safer for women and girls. So yeah, that's how our website looks like. Uh, we shall be sharing with you the link in the in the chat box as well, so that you can check it out in your free time. Thank you very much. Uh, we welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you, Hope, Elizabeth, and Alina. Exciting. I've seen lots of enthusiastic comments in the in the chat. Uh, yeah, Tema is saying she wants to share the Arabic version in her region. Others have said they're going to share it through their networks. So thank, thank you so much. Um, I also have Jennifer joined because she really wanted to hear <laughs> about the course and the work of the Women Institute. So I don't know, Jennifer, if you would like to say something as well. You're, you're online if you can unmute. Or if there are other questions. No, I just got in on the tail end, so I will definitely li <clears throat> listen to the recording. But right. um, yeah, but thanks. I'm just going to sit here and, and listen. But greetings from Somalia. Thanks, Jennifer. Any questions? I mean, I see thank yous and I, yeah, I, um, Catherine Poulton, do you want to say something? You start, you, you also put a message in the chat. I mean, my message was just a message of love. I love every bit of this. Um, I love <laughs> the fact that we're really talking about power. You know, we and often in our meetings, we forget and, we, you know, power is not the center of it. And I love that. And I love that the power, you know, it's about boldly sharing that power um, and also giving us the tools to do that in an intentional, intentional way. So I just wanted to say that I just love everything about this and thank you for sharing. So take that in. <laughs> it's true. It, it, it's, uh, I, I start thinking I want to at least test. I don't know if I'll have a whole half day, but I'd love to, to check, check out the course a bit more. Um, I also think, you know, every time I hear about risk audits and all of this, it really reminds me as well, like here you're talking about aid, you know, SEA in, in distribution of aid. So it's clear that it's SEA, but as SEA is also part of GBV and what we do, I guess we've come closer over the last years as well, a couple of years, instead of saying how important it is that we do engage from, from our community as well in terms of risk audits and, and the follow-up and, and the discussions about power as well. Any any other hands, anyone who wants to say something? Hmm. 
now all this enthusiasm but no <laughs> no one wants to say to their voice okay so let's just um, take maybe I i'll just um thank everyone um including our you know, we have technical advisory groups in each country and globally and catherine stepped into that um recently um but um unicef has been a big part of that and the you know collaboration with the dbv risk mitigation work too because it's not like we're all working on different streams of this so we really try to see how we can share and how we can um support each stream but stronger that way so we're happy to keep doing that and also just to say, if you do share the course, if you want us to make a similar presentation to your networks or to your groups, we're happy to do that. We can do that in different languages. And, um, and we really, really, really want to work with agencies to have you know, these discussion sessions with groups of their staff that go through the course, because we find that how we can help them like problem solve you know, the barriers they're facing and trying to put in place some of these mitigation activities. So um, please get in touch with us. Um, we'll put our, we have a, a group email address in the chat and also put mine um, and we're happy to support in any of those ways. Thank you, Alina. Kate, do you want to, I'm just thinking, I'm not sure if everyone is aware that uh, the GBVIMS is also working with Erin on the e-learning for case management that also has a component on, on PSEA. Did you want to say something on that or it's too early and you want me to not invite you to speak, Kate. I'm putting you on the spot. Um, I think it, it might be better if we had, uh, yeah, a bit of a bit of prep time um, and yeah, okay. probably a little bit early, but thanks, Astrid. So just to say it's coming, <laughs> right? So there's, uh, um, we can dedicate time to that when it's the right moment, Kate, and, and go more in depth. But there is that case management training, e-learning as well, that where there's also an, an, um, an effort to talk about PSCA for, for case managers, what it means and what is the role of case managers. Um, I think I'm going to move on to the last um, part of the agenda, but a big, big thank you uh, for that presentation. So now it's over to UNICEF, um, to Lindsay Stark and Derek Brown. If you are online, um, I'll start us off, Astrid. You will start um, us off. Great. Yeah, I don't mind. Also, to say that Lindsay unfortunately had a family emergency, so won't be here, but we're lucky to have Melissa uh, Meinhart with us, who will take over that piece of the presentation. Um, so, you know, this has been a great AOR course, and my favorite people in the world have been speaking. So I feel like it was meant to be. Um, we would like to present with you something that we have really start. We started a couple of years ago and has been really something to try out, right? As all of you know, we have been doing advocacy to prioritize GBV and emergencies for decades. We've used all the arguments, we've shown the data, um, we've tried it all, and people still are asking us, you know, is it really life saving? Is it really a priority? So at UNICEF, we're like, okay, well, let's give it another world. Let's see what else we can do. And so what we have been doing together with Washington University um, is try and, and cost out the inaction on GBV and emergency. So when there's a crisis and we don't prioritize it and we don't act immediately, um, where, you know, how much is that costing us? Um, as far as we know, it has never been done before. There's been plenty of costings around you know, how much GBV costs. So the cost of IPV, on the economy, on um, on uh, health system etc so we're trying to turn that on its head um, and so we want to present the first one of these that we did which was on Colombia um, and the results that we found for Colombia on a very very limited number of, of outcomes and we're currently doing the same study for Nigeria and Myanmar on broader outcomes um, and so this is just an opportunity for you to share the first phase of this research um, by, we hope that by the end of the year, we'll be able to share Myanmar and Nigeria as well. Um, and also share with you, you know, um, some of the feedback we've had from Colombia and some of the things that it's already moved forward. So it's been really exciting to be able to do that. As you can imagine, um, there's not, a, you know, one of the issues has been data, right? Finding the data to be able to run such analyses, which is why we have the countries that we have. Um, so that's the background to this presentation. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Derek and Melissa to take us through the actual study. 
um, and, and all of that. Um, now, if you're not an economist, hold on to your seats because it's quite complex. So we have tried to simplify it significantly <laughs> for people like me. So I hope that it'll make sense and we really welcome um, any questions, any curiosities. Um, just what I ask you to keep in mind is that this is the results for a very limited number of health outcomes as they're going to explain. So the cost of inaction will be much broader and we hope to be able to say a lot more with Nigeria and Myanmar. Um, so Melissa and Derek, over to you. Super, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for tuning in to today's presentation. Um, I, I share Catherine's excitement for, for being here with you all today. Um, and from our end, we'll be sharing our findings from our study in Colombia, estimating the economic cost of physical intimate partner violence um, among young women and adolescent girls in, in Colombia. And as Catherine mentioned, this study is part of a partnership between UNICEF and Washington University, um, where we've been collaborating since 2019 to conduct several costing studies related to gender-based violence in humanitarian settings. The work started by systematically examining the landscape of studies costing gender-based violence in low and middle-income countries. Um, and we then met with uh, several stakeholders to review the gaps and identify opportunities to leverage economic costings of gender-based violence to both improve advocacy and funding. Um, from that, two projects resulted, one which identified um, a costing framework for safe spaces and referral pathways, and one which we'll discuss today to identify the economic cost of inaction or maintaining the status quo. Um, and we also, just to say, uh, have two upcoming costing studies uh, based on this ex from our experiences in Colombia. Uh, to identify the economic cost of intimate partner violence in Nigeria and Myanmar as well. And so we're looking forward to, to sharing those findings in, in the near future. Um, the research team from Washington University is led by Dr. Lindsay Stark, uh, who sends her apology for today. Uh, she really wanted to, to join, but uh, as Catherine mentioned, some unexpected circumstances arose. And our leads our team's leading economist, Dr. Derek Brown, is also joining us today. Um, and yeah, my name is Melissa Meinhardt, and I've been working at, as a part of this team since the start of, of the project. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. So the impetus for this work um, really has been in recognition uh, that gender-based violence and IPV more specifically is, is widespread. Um, across humanitarian settings, yet the quantifiable impact of gender-based violence um, across various levels of society remains under-examined, um, particularly uh, among adolescent girls, despite the fact that first experience of intimate partner violence often occurs during adolescence. Um, and costing estimates can highlight um, the burden of intimate partner violence, not only for the survivor, importantly, but also at the societal level. Um, and and um, the truth of the matter is as well, that costing estimates are increasingly in demand by uh, donors and, and advocacy communities. Um, so in order to improve the evidence-based responses and to inform the increasing donor demand for costing estimates, um, we believe that providing evidence on the economic burden of intimate partner violence uh, could, could inform uh, investments in both prevention and response programming. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did do a review to try to understand the landscape of costing studies um, specific to gender-based violence in humanitarian settings. We quickly needed to broaden that to low and middle income countries given the dearth of evidence that we were seeing. Um, and we found that there really are only a few um, studies costing into partner violence that exist. And oftentimes these are from high income Anglo-Saxon countries, um, mainly the US, Australia, the UK. Um, and our research identified that there were or only eight studies costing intimate partner violence from low and middle income countries, 
with Ecuador being the only other South American country that has conducted a costing of intimate partner violence. Uh, important just to flag here and kind of set the foundation for, or a, a bit of a teaser, I guess, for the rest of the presentation. So in Ecuador, um, the estimated annual cost of intimate partner violence was 109 million US dollars. Uh, and there has been no other peer reviewed study that we're aware of that has examined the cost of intimate partner violence among conflict affected women and girls. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. So bearing all of this in mind, um, Columbia provided as uh, a pretty ideal context for piloting piloting this work. Um, for one, Columbia's policies have made an important step toward promoting gender equality and addressing violence. Um, these policies, particularly the, the national action plans, highlight how the Colombian government is taking a concerted effort to address gender-based violence. Um, and the government also prioritizes evidence-based responses um, as seen by its leadership in conducting the 2018 Violence Against Children Survey, uh, which we did ultimately use as our primary, primary data source. So again, our, our findings are specific to uh, women and girls ages 13 to, to 24. Um, however, on the flip side, even with progressive policies, gender-based violence remains a key issue. Um, the WHO estimates that around 30% of women in Colombia have experienced physical or sexual IPV during their lifetime. Um, and more importantly, the, the conflict history in Colombia provided an opportunity to explore um, how the cost of IPV may or may not differ among women and girls based off of their conflict exposure, which was a, a really key area of interest among our team. So kind of in short, we felt that Columbia's active attention to the known issue of intimate partner violence could position Columbia as a global leader in the way it, in which it addresses violence, um, especially if these policies critically address the overlooked period of youth um, and address the exacerbating impact of IPV in post-conflict settings. So Derek will discuss the, the methods further, um, but in brief, I, I just wanna highlight a few things. Um, so again, we use the Columbian VAX from 2018 as our primary data set um, to specifically examine the health-related economic cost of physical intimate partner violence against women and girls ages 13 to, to 24. Um, it's also important to note that our approach provides a snapshot in time. That is to say the total health cost um, for, for this, this population, but it doesn't provide estimates across the lifespan, which we know would magnify the cost given the cumulative harm caused by intimate partner violence. Um, the reason for that is overall our team wanted to prioritize um, using robust uh, and defensible estimates um, using a rigorous methodology. Um, something again that Derek will describe further. So I'll, I'll hand things over to him right now to describe our approach and findings further. Thank you, Melissa, uh, and everyone for your interest here. Um, so I will kind of summarize some of the methodology steps and results um, that are on the subsequent slides here. Um, I think kind of the overarching thing is to um, lay out that we undertook a methodology um, that aligns as, as much as we could with common best practices for costing, uh, estimating the health burden of violence. And there's certainly kind of a large economics literature on costs of injury and, and violence. Um, frequently, though, these things run into to data limitations. Um, so I have. Um, Kind of prior to this, um, done uh, two sort of large uh, U.S. studies on on costs of of uh, intimate partner violence, um, and done a couple of others um, in um, or or teamed with folks in Australia and the U.K. and and consulted with others. So adapting these things here with with what we had available, and then focusing in particular on 
uh, the uh, unique ways that women and girls are um, affected by conflict um, or impacted by IPV, um, we went to the data sources to basically see what, what could we put together uh, using the accepted methods. Um, so despite those limitations, we first basically identified uh, samples um, as Melissa described based on conflict, conflict exposure. Uh, so if a survey respondent had um, reported witnessing internal conflict, um, experiencing forced migration, um, or was registered in a conflict area um, in, um, in Colombia, uh, we placed them in a, a conflict affected subgroup. And then analyses were basically done separately for the non-conflict and for the conflict groups. Okay, so uh, to kind of begin with there, we had these two separate groups um, and, and prevalence data. And then for each of those uh, two groups, we estimated uh, the relative risk of different health outcomes and um, uh, an epidemiologic uh, concept, uh, the population attributable fraction. Um, and I think basically the way to think of that is, is what proportion of those, those negative consequences um, are likely to be attributable to um, intimate partner violence. Um, that required then at that point, um, bringing in some other data on, on what are the costs of those consequences. Um, and uh, the source that we built on here was the Global Burden of Disease uh, series. Um, so I'm sure many are familiar with that, the GBD um, estimates of, of dollies or disability adjusted life years. So we had those broken down by these different health um, outcomes. Um, which were attributed to uh, intimate partner violence. Um, then those dollies in turn were converted into uh, dollars or monetary costs. And we did a whole series of um, sensitivity analyses to investigate kind of uh, the implications of some of our assumptions. This slide shows some of the measures, um, the health outcomes, and some of the control variables that we used. Um, everything is actually um, now available in a uh, peer-reviewed manuscript, um, and, um, and we can share the link for that. Um, that was fortunate to um, come out in the last couple of months. Um, so where did we get these outcomes um, in, these, in these covariates here? Um, essentially, we built from kind of uh, the systematic review that um, Melissa mentioned um, to understand those impacts of, of IPV in humanitarian settings. Um, and then um, that list naturally is going to be somewhat longer. Uh, so what you see here is more the intersection of that with the available measures that we had um, in this, this fact survey, the uh, violence um, survey. And then further, we needed to overlap that with the global burden of disease outcomes. So we needed to have quantifiable things. Um, we know um, that this is going to lead to an underestimate, um, but we're um, kind of as, as described, uh, doing what we can to, to come up with um, kind of the first and, and new estimates in this area. So. This will be a, a conservative uh, summary. Um, in terms of the control variables, uh, these are fairly standard things, of course, in, in social science or health research, um, but these are also things that were available in the survey for us. Um, and then we used four different questions about violence experience. Um, that included uh, whether a respondent had experienced physical IPV, um, and whether that was perpetrated by a boyfriend or romantic partner, an ex, um, a husband, um, or, or other partner. Okay, here, um, this just shows kind of that, that first step or first stage here. So this is the, the prevalence, um, what proportion of the uh, survey respondents or the sample uh, in Colombia, uh, reported conflict exposure, and then 
how IPV um, varied between those two groups. So you can see the 24% the conflict affected and then how um, conflict, uh, sorry, prevalence of physical IPV is, is roughly twice as high um, in the, the conflict affected area versus the non-conflict affected areas. Okay, and kind of as a preview, what we found is not only is the prevalence of IPV higher, that the, the impacts or the, the consequences um, were somewhat greater um, and larger in the conflict affected areas. So we seem to have a kind of a more severe um, uh, impact there. Okay, on this slide, uh, this is some of our primary findings. I know there's a lot of numbers here, so I'll, I'll kind of summarize. Uh, things to note here, um, again, these are conservative numbers. Um, but totaling up those health consequences that you saw, kind of if we look down this, this first column here that says full sample, um, with a conservative approach, um, we estimated the total health costs um, of physical IPV against women and girls, uh, 13 to 24, um, at uh, either 268 billion pesos uh, or 91 million US uh, dollars. Um, it's also important to note, um, again, that this is uh, sort of a, a one year snapshot, um, which is a measurement thing from the data. Um, so as was mentioned earlier, um, you don't want to think of this as, as a lifetime cost per se. This is, this is in the year uh, 2018. So overall lifetime consequences um, for an individual would be um, magnified, obviously, over, over years and years. Um, then kind of between those two columns on the right, uh, we've got the conflict affected and the non-conflict affected. So it's just broken down uh, by those, those methods that I described. Um, and even though it's only about one in four women uh, and girls in the conflict affected regions, um, they accounted for a full 39% of the health costs. So that's being driven, um, as we said earlier, both by that higher prevalence of IPV, but also somewhat worse uh, consequences um, in those areas. So, so it's more common and more somewhat more damaging and more costly in, in terms of these health conditions. Okay, so um, a few kind of considerations to keep in mind here. Um, we're certainly aware of, um, uh, on the one hand, kind of the relatively narrow scope of this. Um, we're talking about physical IPV only. Um, but these are costs in a single year, uh, 2018. Um, so sort of what we would call a, a prevalence snapshot. Um, the estimates are, are conservative. They're going to be lots and lots of other uh, economic costs, um, in particular, uh, probably educational, uh, labor market, and then um, kind of income and asset-based costs. Um, we're making some efforts right now to, to try to address those, um, hopefully in, um, uh, in the two ongoing studies um, that were mentioned um, in Myanmar and Nigeria. Um, but uh, we had some data challenges um, that, that precluded us um, in the case of Colombia here. Um, I'll note that those costs have actually been shown in kind of the, the, the Western, um, like US and UK studies um, to be oftentimes larger than the, than the health costs. Um, and then of course, uh, just kind of, you know, putting the economist's view a little bit in, in perspective, um, these are only the things that, that we can monetize, of course. You know, I, I would never try to pretend that um, these are necessarily all the things that matter and all the reasons, but they give us um, kind of a, a, that language for decision makers. Um, another uh, quick note is that first bullet point then. So um, any costs of um, mortality or femicide um, are also excluded uh, from these data. And um, again, unfortunately, that's, that's a measurement issue. 
um, that that we would need to address uh, probably from a um, from a different source. Um, there's some technical things described in the paper. Um, so we did the best that we could in terms of combining with the global burden of disease series, um, which is certainly very valuable. Um, but there's not a complete match in certain areas between that and the and the VAX data. Okay, so to kind of sum up how to think about these, I think there's really, um, or we think there's really kind of two key takeaways. Um, one is that um, even though you know we've described them as as conservative estimates, um, I think you know these are certainly quite large and um, should be taken very seriously. Um, I think decision makers, and we would like to communicate this to them as this is a cost of inaction. So from sort of a, a public health or social perspective, this is what, what we are, um, these health consequences alone are costing the health system, they're costing uh, women and girls and families. And these costs could be avoided if we did not have um, this violence, um, these things uh, based on the data, based on the kind of the, the epidemiological um, perspective uh, would not happen, okay? Um, and they're, they're an underestimate. Um, then second, of course, is our particular interest in the conflict affected areas and the fact that we have that, that disproportionate um, burden happening there. So that asymmetry um, really, uh, we think, sheds light on the need for um, policies to, to particularly focus on supporting um, women and girls who are affected by conflict. All right, Melissa. Sure, thanks, Derek. Um, so yeah, just to just to kind of wrap things up. Um, in, in summary, we we hope that our estimates from these data can provide a variety of stakeholders with the with a snapshot of the economic burden of an action from a single year. Uh, again, that is the cost lost to society because into excuse me because into a partner violence occurs. So um, as Derek was, was saying, you know, put in another way, if IPV were fully prevented, then these annual costs of 90.6 million uh, USD could be recouped by society and used for other purposes. Um, you know, the, the economic uh, notion of, of opportunity cost. Um, and so our findings are really highlighting that these costs are, are significant. Um, and uh, that it's really important and, and that we prioritize um, and acknowledge gender-based violence in, in humanitarian and conflict-affected settings. Uh, because to the extent that IPV continues, we should expect that these same costs will be incurred annually for this population. And of course, would increase as the rate of IPV increases. Um, so bearing in mind the overwhelming health burden of intimate partner violence, um, effective prevention programming is, is actually likely to be more cost effective than maintaining this status quo of inaction. Um, I also want to recognize um, um, from a programmatic perspective that ongoing work from Maestro and the Columbian Institute of Family Welfare um, has resulted in a costing exercise related to the National Action Plan preventing, for preventing violence against children. Um, and complementary efforts such as this can allow for a compre comprehensive understanding of how the current cost and health impact of violence, as well as um, a deeper understanding of what spending is actually required to, to address our, uh, the, the issue. Our hope is that these continued efforts can can support the efforts of, of Colombia to, to continue being a leader um, in addressing, addressing violence. Um, I also um, want to just in, in closing, um, in let, let everyone know again that we do have two upcoming costings in Nigeria and Myanmar as well, uh, which will examine uh, the, the labor burden of intimate partner violence. Um, 
as we hope to promote a more comprehensive understanding of the cost of intimate partner violence to, to better support women and girls, uh, particularly in conflict settings. Uh, you know, in, in recognition that this is the first study of its kind, so we're really trying to lay a foundation um, to understanding the, the broader uh, impacts and outcomes associated with uh, gender-based violence in humanitarian settings. Um, I do, it just goes on the next slide. <laughs> I do have an eye on the time and um, we don't have loads left, but I, I wanna extend a, a sincere thank you for taking this time um, with us. Um, and we hope that you remain engaged and welcome any questions here or via email. I've, I put my email in the chat um, and, and Lindsay and Catherine's both were available at the beginning of this presentation. Um, so I'll pause here and see if there are any questions, uh, but thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, you know, it's quite exciting. Um, at least we think it's quite exciting. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's showing 40% of the health burden being, being um, linked to the conflict affected women and girls, knowing that it's a very small age group that we looked at and a very small number of outcomes just gives us an inkling of, of, of just the, the magnitude of, of what it costs us not to prioritize GBV in emergencies. Um, and so we're looking forward to, to Nigeria and Myanmar to, to help us consolidate that and see what comes out of that. We have more data from those two places. Um, so, you know, we're very excited to see what comes out. Um, and also just to thank, you know, PRM, this is part of our Safe From The Start grant. Um, and and it's, it's a real privilege to be able to explore new ways of framing the, the narrative. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Catherine and everyone. I know we're supposed to end, but I do think if there are any burning questions, as some might have to leave, but I do think it would be a shame not to have, you know, take the time if there is any, yeah, if there are burning questions that you'd like to discuss now about the, re the research. Otherwise, um, anyone? No, everyone is thinking. Any reactions? Mm, no. Then let let's you know meet again. We will meet bef before, of course. But let's. I look forward to hearing what comes out of Nigeria in the next rounds, also on the labor and going beyond the health. It is super important that we have a bigger, bigger evidence base and that, as you say, we've been trying to advocate using all our other arguments. So, so this is a very welcome contribution for all of us. Um, ah, great. And Catherine is saying there will be a two page summary uh, of the findings. So we look forward to sharing that through our networks as well, Catherine. So with that, we're extremely on time. It's <laughs> at the top of the hour. Okay. Then thank you so much, everyone. I think, yeah, thank you everyone for sharing and for making this call so super interesting for everyone. And uh, I see from Cecilia, yeah, we can make a link with the GBV subcluster in Colombia. And that would make sense. Uh, that there's a presentation maybe for the subcluster there as well. Great. Then thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, let's, let's talk again soon. And let's meet again soon. And please reach out to, to Catherine and um, everyone and Alina Potts and the researchers and everyone for uh, with questions you have. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Micah. 
Bye, Astrid. Nice to see you. I thought it was you opening your mic like. I was. I was going to say bye, wrong. and then no one else was saying bye. So then I was just looking for the red button. <laughs> okay. Bye, colleagues. Thank you. Bye. bye and thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>